Good morning. Uh, this is the Dr. Obin Tushaka show. And uh, today uh, we're gonna have a, a very special program. Uh, the title is Astrology, the Cosmic System for Knowing Your Personal Character and for Awakening Your, your Divinity. Uh, and we have a very special guest today, uh, my sister, uh, Sandrea. So the purpose of this show is to um, enable people to have a better sense of the powers that lie within each of you so that uh, you can draw on them and draw on both the uh, strengths that you have as a person um, and also draw on the uh, internal strengths to that person, which is the divinity uh, within. So my special guest is my sister, Sandrea, uh, who's a master astrologer, healer, and poet. Welcome, Sandrea. Thank you, Shaka. I'm so happy to be on your show today. Yeah, this is a special sister. I'm really proud of my sister because um, she has taken the gifts that she was born with, and uh, she has utilized them to help humanity. And some people uh, might have at some point said, well, what is astrology? And what is all this spiritual stuff you're doing? She had the courage to listen to her inner spirit and to follow her own path. And as she's gonna tell you later, astrology played a real role. So mm -hmm. I'm really proud of her. Um, my mother, uh, Sylvia Bradley, uh, was very proud of her because she knew that she was serving humanity in her way. And she's also a rebel. I fought <laughs> to uh, get jobs open in corporate America and she got one of those and rebelled against it. <laughs> she did not like corporate America and I'm the same. So I did not feel like, oh, you didn't take advantage of the opportunities we provided you. Opportunities, my butt. She got to see what it was like and she didn't like it. So she's a rebel. She's a spiritual rebel and um, loving person. She exudes love. She's also a gifted poet, in addition to being a master astrologer. So um, we spent some time preparing for this because uh, we wanted to do this right. So my sister has years of experience uh, in astrology. Um, it's rare that an astrologer is able to earn a living uh, through astrology. And when you do, you have to be real good because um, people are gonna let you know whether or not they think that um, you are accurate in what you said about them and too many negatives and you're not working in astrology. So she demonstrated, she wasn't just good, but she was usually the top in any place where she worked, she could earn a living that way. And that's real key because we've been talking about mastering the masters and we've been talking about the divinities within and you knowing your own personal light. And so uh, she she's been able to live according to her light, uh, both in terms of the way she earned a living and the way she lives. And sometimes our light doesn't coincide with our profession. We just can't help it. But in her case, she had the courage to pursue it and it worked well. Sandrea was hired at Sunset Mental Health, a mental health outpatient treatment center in San Francisco in 1969. Um, after the director uh, received a, a reading and he was a psychiatrist or psychologist and I would assume knew nothing about astrology, um, Sandrea's so reading blew him away. This is the acid test, by the way. For many of you who are gonna watch this show, you're into astrology, but a lot of you are not. And I'm gonna tell you the acid test with anything is, does it work? 
get your chart done and by someone who's good. And so this guy, this was supposed to be her boss and I don't think Sandra accepts anybody as her boss. She worked, uh, she was supposed to work for me in Pan-African Publisher. She was my boss. She gave me the direction. <laughs> <laughs> and I never contradicted her because she did a real good job. She sold a lot of books, you know what I mean? And she knew what she was doing. She had her computer system and all this stuff. So um, she did this mind-blowing reading to her boss. And um, she had been hired as an office worker. But after that, uh, her responsibility was to do the chart of patients. I assume read it to the patient and read it to her boss, so-called. Um, and so then they hired somebody else in the job she had had as an office worker. And, uh, and she got a day off too. So, you know, my sister's a Pisces. So if you know anything about that, that would be a very good reward for her. Get out of this rat race work world, even though she's now doing work she likes to do. Um, so, Sandra, do you want to make any comments on the value of psychologists or psychiatrists using astrology as a way to help their patients? Do you know of other situations where this has been done? Okay, but first I want to say during those days in 1969, we didn't have computers. We had to uh, okay. construct charts with logarithms. So I learned how to work straight from the ephemeris. I did not draw up their charts. It was what I could do from the ephemeris, and it still made his job better. What was, I think, so great, what he told me was that um, it would have taken him sometimes weeks, sometimes months to get to the degree of understanding his patients without the astrological uh, feedback that I would give him. And so... Um, what is so beautiful about astrology, it not only talks about our personality and all like that, but it, it, um, it mirrors what's going on underneath in our subconscious, in our unconscious. And if you have that belief in other lifetimes, it's going to show you what you're carrying through in other lifetimes. And that's was something that psychology could not do. I mean, once they uh, understood what the uh, problems, uh, the, the psychological, uh, perhaps uh, difficult or negative problems going on in the subconscious, then now the uh, psychologists can begin their work. Now they can see what kinds of things they can do to assist the person. So yeah. does that answer your question? <laughs> yeah, I think that that's, uh, that's a good point because, um, even when a psychologist gets to know a person, they usually get to know them on a surface level. Right. And uh, you're really getting into the depths of what makes a person tick. Um, Sandrea, in 1974, uh, worked for Astrophone, which was a branch of human potential research. It was the first nationwide telephone astrological consulting service in the United States. Out of 150 applicants, she and another woman were the top astrologers. So that's, that's real key. And that's a lot of work that she's doing in that position. She was then the third person hired and trained by Jim Lewis, the founder of Astro Cartography, a system of geographical astrology. Could you define the meaning of geographical astrology and the value of found in using this system personally and uh, in the lives of others? Oh my gosh, that was a life changer. Um, astrocartography is a system where you take your birth chart and you lay it over the map of the world. And now you know in what countries you have uh, certain configurations. Like for instance, I have Chiron and uh, Chiron has these, uh, it has the gift of traveling between dimensions and worlds. Well, the country for me where that was at was Brazil. And I was literally sent there four times in Brazil. And the initiation, the experiences I had were all Chironic. There was one point 
where I was at this waterfall and I went so far into the deep inner world. I was with a group of people that kind of understood that and they gave me a lot of space. But when I came back, I didn't even know what I was, who I was, where I was. It, it, but when I came back, I was re, realigned, reset, shifted. I was a different being. So just to give you an ex, you know, that, that was just an example to give you. So you can find, very often you'll find that the love of your life will come from your Venus zone, wherever the Venus zone happens to be. And so it's an amazing art. The, the, and then the, because I traveled and I moved so many places, I got to personally experience what would happen to me. Like, for instance, I got sent to Maui and Maui was my moon zone, okay? And imagine I'm trying to find a place to live in Maui and they have, you know, they have these apartment things that are saying, what's your job? Uh, well, astrology, who's gonna hire you for that? Who's your boss? God. What's your bank account? God. So it looked impossible that I was gonna be able to find a place to live. So I finally screamed and yelled at God and said, I need a house and I need one now. And the next morning I was led to this beautiful medicine man who had a, a 14 acre flower farm, a brand new octagon house had been put there. I handed him my little astrology card saying, live your dreams now, palmistry, astrology, tarot. And he kind of went, and then he got very quiet. And then he looked up and he said, you know, my wife and I pray for a beautiful spiritual lady like you come live on our land. This is your home and we are your family. And he treated me like family. I got to sit at the head of the table of all their family gatherings. That was my moon zone. That was my home zone. So those kinds of experiences, each place I would, I would move and live, and no matter what the astrological uh, planets that were overhead, I would have experiences. Oh, and, and Pluto was over my, uh, aspecting my moon during those days. Do you know I was known as an exorcist on that island? The, that, that Pluto was so strong. I had never studied that. I would just ask God, what do I do? And pretty soon it's going around the island that I'm an exorcist. But when I left Hawaii, I have never done that kind of work again. I'm not living in my Pluto zone, so. Uh, you know, you heard a lot of things like Venus and Pluto and Neptune. And in the second part, we're gonna get into how planets have energies and signs mm -hmm. do planets in certain signs. And basically what she was telling you is that there were certain zones that she went into, certain geographical areas where certain energy fields were stronger. And again, my sister's a Pisces and yes. uh, every sign has a particular orientation and hers is very spiritual. And so traveling, she's going into different zones. And so these energies are affected in different ways. And in Hawaii, people have a strong spiritual tradition as well. Yes. Very strong. A uh, good astrologer has to do a lot of study. And uh, that means in addition to reading, you have to do a lot of charts, which is reading people. Because a good chart reading tells the person at, at the basis of the birth chart who the person is. And it will probably tell them dimensions they don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, that was really key in, in her work. And it's key in the work of any good astrologer. You have to have the gift, but then you have to put in the work. And so she's done a lot of that. And that's helped a lot of people. Um, for five and a half years, uh, my sister um, did a um, uh, five and a half year course in the Miracles Academy. She course was given a room and board to allow her force to, to her focus, her attention entirely on God and her spiritual life. See, again, uh, your interest might be business or your interest might be politics or your interest might be music. Well, think about mm -hmm. heaven. Heaven is when you can just do that. You yeah. Know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> so understand when she's doing this, She's in her heavenly zone. Um, 
for the first time in history, um, a religious and uh, spiritual leader summit of the world's diverse faith traditions came together in New York on August 28, 2000 to discuss how to forge a partnership of peace um, with the United Nations. So Andrea was invited to participate in this since this is not aligned to astrology. Oh, that's okay. Um, uh, you don't, don't need think, to read that part. <laughs> don't think that this doesn't have application oh, okay. because mm -hmm. what's happening here is um, she's bringing in her spiritual powers in general of which astrology is a part and it's helping in terms of healing. And right now the planet's in bad shape. It needs some healing. Some people need some healing as well. Hmm. And not just the people who say I'm broken, but the people <laughs> who are breaking people. And I don't really count on them getting healed. I'm on the other side to fight them. I'm a spiritual warrior, but this one, but for those that can be, good luck. 2003 to 2005, Sandrea worked the psychic fair circuit in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, and she used her skills as an astrologer. She reads tarot and her expertise in palm reading or palmistry uh, to provide healing for people. And she earned a good living, 500 to $2,000 a weekend for work. So again, you got to earn a living with this if this is your full-time thing. And when you do these fairs, you just got people coming up. You don't know who's coming up. And they got all kinds of problems. And so you are addressing them. And, and it can be hours of this. And I know it's very draining, but it's also very rewarding. Um, her astrological healing um, is combined also with dance talents. And it led her to be invited to Russia, Sweden, and Brazil to share her talents with people of these countries. And um, she has a traveling thing, as I do, as my mother did. You know, and she's traveling for spiritual purpose to help people. And this is the key point we were making about the, the God within. It's really a question of using your God-given talents to serve humanity. And when you do that, that's when you access the higher powers. And that's what she's been doing. She's also, Sandrea is a gifted poet and a sacred dancer. And she has been a, in a hiatus for about 15 years. Um, where she's been addressing health conditions and she's been able to cure herself. And consequently, uh, she's got certified as a self-help instructor in a modality called Jin Shin Ji. Jitsu. 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 Jin Shin Jitsu, yeah. Co which corresponds with astrology. So she's doing other kind of healing work. And we know now our people and humanity in general is in need of a lot of healing because a lot of mess has been put on people. She, th she then dove deeply uh, into spiritual work and is now ready to assist in the amazing time of spiritual awakening. So she's gone back to address health, and get her health top notch, and uh, she's back out to now contribute to the health of others. Anything else you wanna add to that, Sandra? I just want to say that I don't think many people know, but the stars are inside of us as well as above us. It's in my study of, um, of palmistry. You can see the stars in your hands. Um, everything that I have ever studied, this Jin Shin Jitsu. I mean, okay, astrology shows you that in those 12 signs that we are meant to be our own doctor, our own priestess, our own best friend. And it goes around the wheel like that. And so uh, Jin Shin Jitsu really assisted me. First of all, there's an energy lock for each of the signs in each of the planets. So I can on my body help to adjust. Like, you know, too much Mars is going on. I'm seeing myself getting too fired up. I know what position to go in and just, ah, breathe, let go and hold. So, um, and then I also studied a lot with Builders of the Atatum. It's a Western mystery school. And so astrology, you know, there was, a, there was a time when no doctor could be a doctor unless he knew astrology. So um, all I can say is that astrology works and it's so much deeper than anything that people 
have ever um, seen from just plain fortune telling or the newspaper astrology. It goes into spiritual law. I mean, I, I don't know of any branch that doesn't, it doesn't connect with. Yeah, that's, that's extremely important what she's talking about there because it's a master system and it's a shame so many people have been turned off from it, though many embrace it. And those that have shutting themselves off from something very valuable. Yeah. Uh, in terms of my own background, my background, uh, I have not done astrology full time the way Sandrea has. Uh, it's been while I was doing other things. And um, we were just tracing the time in which we learned astrology. And um, that's the very time that I also underwent this awakening. And uh, the awakening was to my identity as an African, sixfold stages to mental freedom, something we were taking people through. But at the same time, I was studying astrology, so it gave me a better understanding of my inner self and how to connect uh, my talents, which is what astrology, one of the things that astrology identifies uh, with my consciousness or my identity. So this was a real key. So I do two types of astrology. One is personal charts, and the other is historical astrology. Uh, mm -hmm. That's called mundane astrology. Since I'm political, I would bring that in. So that is the charts of nations. Nations have personalities just as people do. America definitely has one. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll give a couple of, of experiences in terms of my own personal experience in doing charts, just a couple. Um, one, my father had a friend um, and uh, she, she wanted a reading. Now, when people want readings, it can either be because they want to know more about themselves or they're having a life crisis or something. This woman was very wealthy. She owned a lot of real estate. And... Um, so I'm wondering, what does she want me to do a chart for? This was my first chart. I actually typed it up and I got paid <laughs> for it. <laughs> so this was a big deal. Now, this, the reason I'm saying this is when I did this reading, I won't go into the details of what uh, led me to this conclusion, but there's ways of chart interpretation. So the chart interpretation told me that... Um, as gifted as this woman was in business, she had a big problem. She had people that she knew that she thought were her friends who were not her friends. And this particular planet indicated deception. And in astrology, you have what's called houses. They rule different dimensions of a person's life. She had in what's called friendship, she had deception. And then there's another part that deals with the subconscious that can also be prison. And she had some stuff going on there. So my reading was a lot, along with her chart in general, was, I don't know what you're doing, but if you keep doing it, what's going to happen is someone that you think you're close to is going to betray you, and it could lead to prison. And so my advice is, I don't know what you're doing. Stop doing it. <laughs> now, she was coming to me at that time. So it probably meant that things were getting pretty bad. So I don't know if she, even stopping it at that point would have saved her. But what ends up happening is she was arrested. She had been dealing in some illegal stuff that she didn't have to deal with. She was a multimillionaire real estate investor, but she's doing this illegal side and ended up going to jail. So that was my first chart. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then she got a lawyer that was no good. He, I went to law school for two years. This guy was not a bad lawyer. He just wasn't a criminal lawyer. So that showed me bad judgment on another level. I won't give his name. He was a very prominent politician and supported us in the movement. And I'm sure he was a good lawyer in his own specialty, but it wasn't criminal law. I went to law school with this guy. I know what he was good at. This was not it. So I was wondering, why did you hire him? But so that was one experience. The other one is as a political astrologer, um, 
I will sometimes use astrology when I'm writing. And most people don't know this, but my sister did because she typed the manuscript for my book, The Political Legacy of Malcolm X. She did part of the typing. And being an astrologer, she knew that my chapter on Malcolm the man was based on astrology. I never said it was, but she could read it and see that it was. So she read that chapter. So I was, uh, was able to get Malcolm's uh, birth uh, you know, certificate that had his time and place and date of year of birth. And that's what you cast a chart on. And so I did Malcolm's chart. Now, um, whenever I do something like this, and I'm gonna write about it, I'm not gonna base it just on the chart. There has to be facts that support it. There has to be testimony coming from people, people telling you about the person and so forth. And so um, what astrology enabled me to do was to see Malcolm through his eyes, not the way most people had portrayed Malcolm, even though they got certain things accurate, they were seeing Malcolm through their eyes. And so they saw Malcolm as the political person, which he was. But only my book and a book called The Seven Child identify Malcolm's perspective of him. I was the first and then The Seven Child did an even better job because it's the book by the family. And so what I found by looking at Malcolm because he had a concentration that's a certain place where planets were that indicated that he saw the world through the lens of family. He was a family person. That was like my brother, our brother. He was, everything was seen through the lens of family. And I pointed out before, yeah, we're all raised in families, and various types and so forth. And yeah, we're influenced by family, but all of us don't have a family worldview, Malcolm did. And if you see every key change in his life, that was based on family. So that was crucial. And then one other thing, when I was doing his chart, he had a placement that I have, and a lot, some people have. It's a placement where a certain planet, in this case, Saturn, was in a place where it makes him a world person, or could be, because just because you have this doesn't mean you'll be a world person. But this position, and I, I don't want to go into the details because if you don't know astrology, then this is, you know, shop talk. I just want to say it was in a position that a good astrologer would call the saint's position. Does not mean he was a saint. It meant that if he did one thing wrong in a worldly position, he would fall. One thing. And I've done enough charts to see that works. And we're a person nearly fell like Bill Clinton had the same placement. He didn't fall because he had other things there that saved him, but he nearly fell. He fell in the house. He didn't fall in the Senate. And so Malcolm ended up going down on chickens come home to roost. That's not why they took him out. They wanted him out. But that was the thing that brought him down. So in that sense, in, in re reading charts, I learned that two people can do the same thing. One can temporarily get away with it and the other one can't. And sometimes you need to look to the chart and you need to know these are some things that if I do it, I ain't getting away with it. <laughs> that's true for everybody. So uh, that's uh, one thing. I've also used astrology uh, in organizations uh, where uh, people want an African name. So in Africa, the name is your personality. So uh, I would do a person's chart to uh, name them or at least give them the option of names that they wanted to choose from. And so astrology proved to be uh, very accurate and good for that. Also, people have asked me for names for their babies when their babies are born. And so again, by doing the chart, you know something about the characteristics of a child. Now, I'm not trained in childhood astrology. People, there are certain people that have that gift that know certain planets affect the child's growth in a certain way. I'm not good at that, but I could give them a general picture of the characteristics of this child, who this child was, and therefore uh, they could uh, you know, uh, choose a name that was appropriate. My last name is Tashaka. 
Tashaka uh, means beetle in Zulu. Um, in um, Kemet or in Egypt, Kepra, K-H-E-P-R-A. Uh, Kepra is the rising sun, the sun at 5 a.m. in the morning. So one of the reasons I picked the name Shaka is because I was born at 5 a.m. in the morning. It's also symbolic of creativity. So it's the union of masculine and feminine. The other reason I put the name Shaka is that was the warrior king of the Zulus. That was my conscious reason. There were things <laughs> I liked about Shaka and there were things I didn't like. He went too far in his discipline, you know? Though he had good discipline, he went too far with it. And he had certain issues in his life that, you know, I understood, but not necessarily, that, that led him to not some admirable types of behavior. But overall, overall, I liked his discipline as a warrior. But subliminally, I picked the name Shaka because it's symbolic of creativity. And it's the union of masculine and feminine. So in Kemet, Kepra, the beetle, is believed to be androgynous. They know it's not, but it's the idea of you can't create unless you have both masculine and feminine. You see the Dogon Numo twins that are behind me, they're symbolic of this principle. And Dogon philosophy is centered on the idea that the male and female principle is central to the cosmos and Sirius and Sirius B are symbolic of that. And so Sirius, is a big star and then Sirius B the hidden, but then within Sirius B is another star called Imanya. So Sirius B rules men, Imanya rules women. The universe came into being out of the big bang and it came out of a drawer star, the Dogon believe it was Sirius B. So for me, my uh, subliminal reason for picking this name uh, was astronomical and it had to do with and astrological, it had to do with what would become a life challenge for me, bringing together the uh, feminine uh, and the masculine. Um, Sandrea knows, and I've talked to viewers, that I went through a 15-month period a retreat where I had to look at myself to work on the feminine. Sandrea played a role in that. You want to talk about your role in that? <laughs> Well, I just didn't think at that time, I'm his little sister, so I don't think that you necessarily saw me as um, um, someone that you wanted to follow my direction. So being the Pisces that I am, I did a, um, I went inside. Is that, is that the story you want me to tell me? That's, yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. I spent a whole day out there in nature and um, talking to Shaka, talking to you, Shaka, um, soul to soul, and told you what I saw, what I thought you needed, and where I thought you needed to go. And I took a long time just really talking soul to soul to make sure I wasn't doing any manipulation, but really you know, addressing some issues that I saw for you and mirroring them to you. And then I didn't say anything. I came home and there was a phone call from you. So I just planted a little seed that I thought you needed to go to this special retreat place. And then we hung up. And the next day you were calling me back saying, where is this place? And so it felt really good that, you know, we could connect, even though on the mental level, it didn't look like you would have believed anything I had to say, but soul to soul, your soul recognized truth. And off you went. <laughs> <laughs> See, here's where my sister was, was working on my spirit um, <laughs> to help me do what I had to do. And then much to her surprise, it ended up being five years of three months a year of internal work. And again, astrology was key because it pointed out to me the dimensions of my character that I was weak on, one of which was clearly the feminine, the emotional, the intuitive. Even though I was intuitive, I wasn't aware of a lot of the intuitive things I was drawing from. And even though I was into astrology, you know, I was still 
very much captured in this linear um, intellectual realm, even though it was black in Africa. You know what I mean? So this was a big saving grace. So my sister did some magic. <laughs> good magic. And I'm appreciative. You know what I mean? And it was a good place that she sent me to. Uh, so those are some of the uh, dimensions that have been helpful. I really want to stress that as I was going through this identity transformation, uh, what astrology did, because I was then seeing that I had been miseducated, it was leading me to redirect um, what I looked at and studied uh, to African and African-American. Um, but astrology enabled me to see uh, my strengths and my weaknesses and to see what I had to work on as I went through this process of trying to be the things that I was learning and discarding this Western way. So this was a path and it played an extremely important part. So that's kind of background. So all I'd say is that it's been a valuable thing in my life as it has been in Sandrea's. And um, I am the type that if you had tried to recruit me into it, you couldn't have because <laughs> I was a seat, touch and smell person my uh, favorite saying was, the reality of the situation is, <laughs> meaning if you can't see it, touch it and smell it, it ain't real. And so it took uh, something else for me to see that. So, so that's the key. Um, so that's kind of like background on the two of us. What I wanna do before we start getting into the discussion of how astrology affects us is I wanna get into a discussion of uh, comedic astrology. And um, I'm going to need a PowerPoint, a PowerPoint thing that's going to come up right now. Um, so the important thing to really understand uh, about astrology to start with is um, and astronomy, astronomy is where it comes from, its roots. And um, we have been discussing the uh, Anu and uh, how the uh, Anu uh, were the mothers and fathers of Egyptian or Kemetic civilization going back as far as 10,000 BC. They are also the ones who brought astronomy uh, and astrology to ancient Kemet. Remember, dynastic Kemet, 3200 BC, has everything in place. So it had been developed as far back as 10,000 uh, years ago. Um, so the pyramids um, were located um, along a uh, particular line. And uh, this is Khufu's pyramid uh, that sits on the center of the earth. And uh, it is probably the greatest wonder of the world. Of course, there are many, the Sphinx is one and the other pyramids, but of all the pyramids, Khufu's is the greatest, said, sits dead center on uh, the earth. But it was also an astronomical and astrological uh, library. Uh, so go to the next slide. This is the inside of uh, Khufu's pyramid. Now I've been inside of uh, Khufu's pyramid. In fact, I sat in the uh, burial area for uh, Khufu. I have a picture of me. I didn't have time to put it up. You can see me in <laughs> Khufu's burial chamber. His, of course, his uh, uh, body is no longer there. So what you see inside of um, Khufu's uh, pyramid is uh, the king's chamber. And at the very top of that, there is a place uh, where he, his body lay. And then you see what's called air shafts. Go back, Cinnabar. Go back to Khufu's pyramid. Uh, so what you see is, um, 
going back, <laughs> going back to the uh, picture of uh, the, the Grand Gallery where you see people, uh, you see the openings, go back to that. That opening, those openings that you saw just a minute ago, uh, those are openings where uh, priests stood to observe the stars. Um, and then if we go and look at the uh, picture of uh, Khufu's alignment uh, with the stars, if you can put this uh, stellar alignment, Khufu was aligned to the stars and particularly was aligned to the star Orion. And for the ancient uh, Chemites, Orion was um, representative of Asar. And Asar is the founding ancestor of um, ancient Kemet. And so, yeah, leave this here. So you see, yeah, this is the star cluster Orion. Orion is associated with Asar because Asar uh, is the first ancestor. Orion is the beginning of the stellar system in the Milky Way galaxy, which is our neighborhood, the neighborhood that Earth uh, resides in. And so the Chemites had a special interest in Orion. So their astrophysicists were especially uh, interested in this. Uh, leave these uh, two on that are dealing with Dendera. Uh, so, um, so, so the pyramids were, some of them, particularly Khufu's, was an astronomical and astrological library. In ancient Kemet, uh, the uh, Chemites or the Egyptians were the uh, first to give birth to astronomy and astrology. I want to quote uh, from Herodotus. Herodotus is the uh, Egyptian, um, he, he's the, he, the Greek person who traveled in Egypt and made observations. And this was an observation and, and his observations are very reliable. For example, he observed that the Egyptians or Chemites were black. It was matter of fact observation because that was known throughout the world. And he said a lot of other things, but this is what he said about astrology page 108, the history of Herodotus. The Egyptians likewise discovered to which of the gods each month and day is sacred and found out from the day of a man's birth what he will meet with in the course of his life and how he will end his days and what sort of man he will be. Discoveries whereof the Greeks engaged in poetry and have made use. In other words, what he's describing here is um, that the uh, Chemites or the Egyptians gave birth to astrology as well as astronomy. And when he said they could determine by a, time, a person's time and date of birth, the course of his life, it meant they were looking at his chart. Now, of course, most astrologers today would not say they could predict when a person was going to die. And of course, a key thing to understand about astrology is you make your choices. So it does not predetermine what you're gonna do with your life. But the point is this began with them. Now in, in Kemet, there were no personal charts done, only the chart of the Pharaoh because uh, the Pharaoh was considered to be the representative of God on earth. We're all gods, but he was the one that communicated or communed with the sun. He had to uh, maintain Ma'at, or just order, for the society to be in right order. But the Greeks and others would take this and use this for personal charts, which is how uh, you deal with it today. Uh, if we go back to um, the uh, pictures of um, the temple of Dendera, if we can get back to that, um, we will see that uh, Dendera provides uh, the comedic portrayal of uh, the elliptic um, or the zodiac. So when we deal with astrology, astronomy, uh, basically what we're dealing with is the apparent path of the sun um, 
as it appears through the sky um, as a result of um, its relationship to the earth and uh, its relationship to uh, the other planets that re revolve around it. The ecliptic is the planar path of the earth's orbit around the sun. And we know that's 365 and a quarter days. The calendar you get today was the Kemetic or Egyptian calendar uh, based on tracking that orbit among other things. The moon, the planets, they all follow a similar orbit around the sun as does the earth. Uh, so uh, the, the elliptical line um, is the path that these uh, planets follow. And um, they uh, all have their orbit or their time of movement. And so in the temple of Dendera, leave this up, don't change it. In the temple of Dendera in Egypt, um, this is a temple uh, dedicated to the Netter Hathor, who was the Netter of music um, and art and things like that, female Netter. Um, it shows, this shows the comedic knowledge of the zodiac. And um, so what we're seeing here in this picture is a picture of the zodiac. And um, there are two. There is one that occupies the ceiling, this one here. And so, uh, and then uh, there is another one uh, that is also carved in stone. We'll see that later. I want to focus on this one uh, first. What we see here are all the signs of the zodiac. Um, so you can see the lion, you can see the crab, uh, you can see the archer, or what would be called Sagittarius. Um, you can see all the astrological signs here. And so this is the zodiac. And the line, the center line, is uh, the elliptic, or the path through which uh, the planets move as they move in relationship to these zodiacal signs. And so, you know, Sun and Leo, Sun and, and so in Kemet, uh, these had uh, different names. Uh, so um, what we see then is the temple of Dendera is carved uh, this zodiac. Uh, indicating that the Kemites understood this. Um, now, what we'll find here are all the astrological signs. We also find uh, four planets, Mercury, uh, which is in Virgo. Um, we find Mars. Um, we find Jupiter. Jupiter is in Cancer. Um, Libra uh, is uh, there uh, in Mars and, and so forth. Venus is near Pisces. Now, in most cases, what they're showing you is the ideal place for a sign in a planet. And uh, that, again, indicates uh, a real knowledge of astrology because it means they were using this uh, to figure out how this impacted the pharaoh and uh, affected Kemet. So whereas today astronomy is separate from astrology and ancient Kemet, they were married as they were in India, in China, among the Aztecs, Toltecs, Incas, Mayans, and the mother civilization, uh, Olmecs. Um, so this is just an indication that the Kemites were very precise in their knowledge of the planets and the way in which the planets or astronomy um, and their signs related to astrology. They did both at the same time. Um, so also found in this are the, 20, the 36 deacons, Sandrea could explain what those are in a minute, D-E-C-A-N, uh, each sign has three. Um, and then finally, um, this um, particular zodiacal uh, picture that appears in the temple of Dendera 
uh, also includes Orion. And so it is also dealing with the stellar system. So we can go back, uh, that kind of gets into an, an introduction to the comedic birth of astronomy, astrology. And um, we can go back uh, to uh, what we were gonna discuss before. So Andrea, could you explain what deacons mean in astrology? Yes, um, take your birthday. I'll take you as a Leo. Um, there are 30 degrees to every sign. So if you happen to be born a Leo, if you're born between the first 10 degrees of the bar. sign. Huh? Oh, go ahead. Oh, if you're born with, uh, within the first 10 degrees of the sign, you're a Leo. And if you're born within the next, between 10 and 20 degrees of the sign, it goes around the zodiac. And then you would be Leo with a Sagittarian undertow. And then you go to the third degree of the sign. Now you're Leo with an Aries undertow. And so in myself, I'm Pisces, but I have a Scorpio undertow. And that's because I was born the last degrees within, uh, actually, I think it was 26 degrees Pisces. So it's like that with all the signs. And many people can, um, can feel that mixture because sometimes you'll read up on a sign and you'll say, well, I don't really quite feel like that. But then you start adding the decan and it just adds another layer to your understanding of yourself. Yeah, I'm born in the second decan of Leo. So mine's Sagittarius. And mm -hmm. so that's got the more intellectual stuff as well as the spiritual stuff in it. As well as the political, right? Yeah, as well as the political. So that orientation is very important. I'm born the same day as Louis Armstrong. And, <laughs> um, he, uh, he was a writer. People know him as a musician. He probably came close to being the innovator of jazz, but um, he also carried a typewriter with him. And after, in, in, in breaks and shows, he wrote. And that's that Sagittarian part, you know what I mean? Right. So that's another side. So the key point is um, the Chemites had the oldest civilization. Some would like to say Mesopotamia was older and they try and date it. And uh, that's the area today called Iraq. They try and give them a hundred years, but there's no proof of that. And um, even if it was true that they came into being a hundred years before Kemet dynastically, and there's no proof they did, um, Kemet civilization begins 10,000 years older. And so this is um, a very um, old civilization and astronomy, astrology played a key part in it. So let's get into um, a discussion of uh, what convinced you uh, that astrology was real? Huh. Well, when Adeline did my chart, I started understanding that um, I understood why I was the way that I, I was. Here I am a Pisces in a family where my mother and you are Leo and my other brother and my father are Aquarius. And then here comes this fish. And no one in the family seemed to understand this emotional fish. <laughs> and I was really more than emotional. I mean, I would go through rages, bit, bits of rage. And I didn't understand that any more than my mother or anyone else. But when Adeline came in and did my astrology chart, turned out, according to some astrologers, I had the most hardest aspect to be able to um, alchemize in my life. And that's Mars, the god of war, opposed Pluto, which is the, is the god of uh, the atom bomb and volcanoes and all that. And once I understood that I had that and, um, and that it, it did have positive, it had other attributes other than that, um, that began me 
um, starting to really believe in myself that um, being able to love myself, really, because I had a hard time. I thought there was something really wrong with me having these rages. Once I started understanding them and learning how to, because astrology, for me, I like to work it along with the uh, sacred tarot. And in the tarot, when you see that um, Mars is that, is that tower card and, uh, and Pluto is the eon, it just helped me to, to see that I wasn't a victim, that, that it was a tower of, of uh, mis mistakes or misunderstandings that I had built, you know, of my perceptions. And once I started taking me responsibility, it also started me out of the land of victimhood. It's really, it was really easy for me to feel a victim to my own self, to my own emotional <laughs> state. Yeah, what Andrea is describing is uh, in our family, uh, me and my brother matched one of our parents. I'm a Leo, my mother's a Leo, my brother's an Aquarius. My father was an Aquarius. So there was some way that the parents could better understand us. She came in in, in a very unique position, you know, as a Pisces and a very spiritual person. And uh, not that my family was not spiritual, but it was hard for them to really understand uh, this lady. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. And, and, I, and, and I also think that's part of what you pick when you come here. Oh right? yeah, I did pick it. And what it, what it did, it made me have to rely on my inner God. Mm -hmm. I had to go to God to mm -hmm. get understanding. Isn't that funny? I had to go to God, but it was that, um, that lack of being seen and understood by the family that really supported my spiritual growth. I could see after I got to a certain phase in my uh, spiritual growth, that it was even the, the hardest, the most painful things in my childhood were all gifts. They were my initiation. Without them, I couldn't be who I am to this day. Mm -hmm. And without That's astrology, I would have, I, I mean, God only knows how I, I, I would have ended up. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know the road not taken, but I don't think I would feel uh, the amount of peace that I feel inside myself at this yeah, day. Because it's, it's the, one of the best systems for self-knowledge. Uh, That's right. Poem, period. Yeah, it's so personal. It's so absolutely personal. Uh -huh. um, and, and just as I've learned not to judge others, because when I understand the wholeness, you just have to say, oh, same <laughs> thing with yourself. You know, oh, yeah. that's me. Okay. <laughs> and you're always finding out. Yeah. Um, for me, uh, what convinced me that astrology was real because I, I, I need proof. You know, I'm the proof person, you know, and that means it's got to work for me. It's got to work. Um, when uh, Sandrea's uh, godmother, Addie, um, who trained us initially in astrology, training her and then Sandrea points out I got into it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how that happened. That was a miracle. I was so surprised that you ended up in that class. <laughs> yeah, it was one of the most rewarding things. But, but what got me in was uh, she did what an astrology is called the spot chart. Uh, Sandra is talking about how she did the math and everything and wouldn't do the, use the computer to do charts. Well, that's the detailed thing, you know, uh, very precise and you know exactly where everything is mathematically. But um, there's a thing called the spot chart that's just based on uh, your time, date, year of birth, especially time, date, year of birth and place. And uh, all they do is based on that position the planets without a lot of precision, but it's in the right places. And so it, it's something you can do quick. So this was a quick reading. And um, Addie 
told me more about myself than my mother knew. <laughs> and some dimensions that I was just discovering, because you're always discovering dimensions about your own self. And so that was the acid test that convinced me, oh, this is real and um, it works. So, so I, I would advise people who have issues about this, get your chart done by somebody who's good too, because everybody out there isn't good at casting charts. And some people are better with some people than others. So that was the acid test and that sent me on the path to um, astrology and some people after uh, would say, oh, he's going crazy. He's into astrology. <laughs> Some of my friends, and I'd hear about that later, you know what I mean? And then later, they ended up embracing it. So I <laughs> said, uh, <laughs> crazy <laughs> like what? Um, let's talk about how astrology has helped you and me in our lives. What do you think our lives would have been like if we had not known astrology, how has astrology helped you and me know ourselves in a deep way? How has it helped you? Yeah, well, um, like I said, I think I kind of answered that already. Um, it really helped me with that Mars opposition Pluto. Holy cow, I could not be who I am today without that. Um, but what also what helps is it, it, it not only points out um, different psychological or um, gifts or whatever that, that you have, but it points out times when they're going to be activated or really highly accentuated. And so it, it becomes like a, a roadmap. And it also helps to understand um, why certain things are showing up in our lives when they, when they show up. Uh -huh. Um, yeah, for me, um, astrology has been a, helpful in a lot of different ways. And, um, one of them, um, has been that it's helped me negotiate life crisis. So, yes, uh, that's, that's been real key. Um, it, it helped me to own up to my part of what I had to handle spiritually. So um, it, it didn't tell me what I had to do, but it showed me what I had to do. It didn't tell me what, but it showed me the area. Uh, so that was one. Uh, the other is um, it gave me um, a, a better understanding of my gifts and um, also uh, my weaknesses. And um, and gifts and, and weaknesses are often pictured as uh, um, negative. You know, no, they are paths to growth. That's right. And so, you know, when you're aware of it, uh, then that's something that you realize that okay, this is something uh, that you have to work on. Um, it helped me understand why I'm a reader, for example. I already knew I was a reader. I asked my grandmother, what was I like when I was young? She said, you'd be on a bicycle with a book. <laughs> Always had a book, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, but I understood why. And I also understood that that was tied to uh, my purpose in life because for me to achieve what I do in life, reading's an important part of it. That's for me. Uh, so, that was uh, one thing. Uh, my sun sign, it, it helped me to better understand the essence of my creative source, um, which, you know, the sun sign can help do. Astrology is often pictured as sun sign. It's your whole chart. It's not just uh, one sign. Um, so it gave me a better understanding of the areas in which my creative expression um, would take place I already knew that I was a reader, but then it helped me understand that. And it's interesting that it fit right into everything I ended up doing because I pursued that. People have gifts and then they don't pursue them. And that is a real tragedy in life because those are your joys. You know, whatever your gifts are, 
when you pursue those, that's where real happiness uh, comes from. Um, so this helped to give me uh, some direction. Um, so that was some of what uh, that did. Also cyclically, um, it helped me better understand as I was going through certain life crises, um, why? I entered the movement in 1961. Um, that was before I started doing astrology. But later when I started doing my chart and other charts, I realized that 1961 um, was in, in line with something. And it was in line with um, certain planetary positions where I had three planets, 21 degrees. And when I entered the movement, one of those planets was at 21 degrees. I didn't know that when I entered in 1961. I didn't know that then, but I knew then that 21 was key, both in terms of the, the year, but in terms of the day of a month, the day of the month, the 21st day of every month, something happens. And what happens depends on how well I prepared for it. If I prepared for it, then it's good. If it isn't, it, because it's it, 21, I've seen is change. It represents change. And so uh, this, this uh, helped me to understand cycles and uh, how cycles work uh, in my life. Um, in, a, in Kemet, they had a saying, and in many other systems, as above, so below. So let's talk about how this idea of as above, so below is manifested in astronomy and in astrology and give some personal examples from your own experience of how this works. Well, for me, uh, the planets that are above, they are mirrors of the powers and the planets we have within. Each, each planet speaks of a different type of power and we have all of them. We are made of the same stuff, stuff bone. Our, our bones is made of star, stardust. So ultimately we can say that is who we are. And another, what are some of the other ways that you see the as above, so below uh, being manifested in a person, you know, the stellar realm being manifested in a person. What are some other ways you see that? Well, I see that every time I, I uh, do a birth chart, you know, um, I know, I know that what I'm, um, that everything is alive. The universe is alive. It's intelligent and it's being mirrored in each, each one of us. And so each time I'm, I'm doing a reading, that's what I'm seeing. Yeah, in other words, what you're seeing inside a person is a miniature universe because they have all of the stellar forces in them that's out there. Absolutely. And I feel for me with the kind of astrology I like to focus on, which is focusing on our divinity, that my greatest joy is to be able to look through all the egoic ways that a person might be holding or perceiving or seeing themselves to be, and to look through all of that and make a connection with their soul. And when I do that, the other person, um, person that I'm doing that for, they, I mean, I've had, I've had people say that sometimes when I've done that, that's the first time that they were able to connect because if we don't go deep enough into our character, into our being, then we're just living on the, on the periphery. We, we have no idea what the truth is about ourselves. Uh, we have no clue as to the depths of our, our nature. And I like to go, I like to do in depth, going in deeper, introducing people to aspects of their of themselves that they may, may not be aware of, then it's up to them after that. 
I've done my job. It's up to them. Are they going to continue to choose and make their decisions based on their ego? Or are they going to be making their decisions based on their soul? To me, those are the, the you know, it makes a difference as to how, whether a planetary configuration ends up being, um, quote unquote, what people consider to be a positive experience or a negative experience. It's all based on basically, because there's a gift in everything. I don't care the biggest life challenge that you go through. It's going to have a gift. And some people, if they want to stay into victimhood, they don't go looking for the gifts. They just show you all the how terrible it is. But if you want to um, connect with the truth of ourselves, we are born creators. There's nothing victim about ourselves. And if we take that approach in our, our lives, it, um, some of the most horrendous aspects can just take you to the heights of your being. And that has happened to me so many times. It's off the charts. Yeah, in fact, I would say that um, the most difficult times in your life, if you learn from those, if you're open to them and grow through them are the most rewarding. When yes. you're going through them, they're painful as hell. That's right. They, they sometimes will shake you to the point you wonder, can you get out of it? <laughs> but if you learn from it, and, and, and one of the things that I think is real key, you don't blame others for it. Though, of course, there are things that people are the cause of and systems are and blame them and then do the fight you have to do. But own your part and the part that you're responsible for, then you've got to own up to it and work on it. And so the end result is growth. That's where growth comes from. Because we come here to learn those things that we don't know. And that's what causes a crisis because we don't know how to handle it. So I agree. I mean, uh, that's what we don't want. You know, we want everything to be peaches and cream, mm. everything to be nice, nice. Mm. Mm. But in living in this society, uh, that ain't gonna <laughs> happen. But in the real world, I don't care where you are, that ain't gonna happen. So yeah, I agree. You know what I mean? <laughs> Um, yeah. You know, in terms of as above, so below, um, I've discussed before on this show that the ancient Egyptians or Chemites had a term for a student, Seba, was S-B-A, and then with the vowel E, S-E-B-A, and that meant star, that they saw a student as a person, a being, who had a light within them. It's a star, stellar light. And so the goal of education was to bring the light out. Now, the key point is that was their conception of a human being because they understood that the human being had many stars within them. And of course, the greatest one is God. And then all the stellar universe, the planets and everything else, spiritually, their energies are inside of us. So uh, that was the first conception of a human being. <clears throat> and if you have that idea, you have an idea of power as opposed to I'm an individual that is alone by themselves and uh, is up against the world. And so the Dogon had a concept because they were master astrophysicists as well. They said that the human being is a reflection of the cosmos. It's a cosmic being. Who has the power to change the cosmos? Yes. And the cosmos, in turn, has the power to change the human being. And that's the truth. And now astronomy, which is separate from astrology, so it's purely material, and it's an important area, you know, but to separate these two, and we'll get into that in a minute, is to disempower you because you got all these planets up there, you don't know what they're doing. Everything, astrophysics, quantum physics, all of it shows everything's energy in this universe. And that's really God force, you know, everything on the planet. So we're cosmic beings. And the miniature cosmos is what we are and everything God created. 
But we have a special role, according to the Vambara, of being the ones that God created because God wanted a being that God could communicate with. And I'm sure God create, communicates with all the creatures, animate and inanimate, but this is a special group. And why? Because of all the creatures God created, this is the only one that can throw the cosmos out of balance <laughs> and has, and is the only one that can bring it back into balance. And so, you know, I think that this cosmic thing is really key. My sister just said that uh, we're made of cosmic dust. I've made a point of this before. Now, astronomers in the West have just discovered this. The Chemites knew it, um, the Dogon, the Chinese, Native Americans, all these people knew this. You know, I mean, this is not new knowledge, you know. <laughs> the Big Bang, if it all came out of a dwarf star or even a smaller star, then it means that we all came out of a uh, stellar explosion. It's in us, you know what I mean? <laughs> and then we now find that everything God created is made up pretty much of the same stuff. So I just went and uh, want to share with you just how close your stellar composition is to the stars. You have the exact same composition chemically as the stars. The stars have 65% oxygen, and so do you. 18.500 carbon, so do you. 9.5% hydrogen, and so do you. 3.2% nitrogen, and so do you. 1.5% calcium, and so do you. 1% phosphorus, and so do you. 0.4% potassium. I eat a lot of bananas. <laughs> I know something <laughs> about potassium. Uh, so do you. 0.3% sulfur. And so do you. 0.2% sodium. And so, so do you. 0.2% chlorine. So do you. 0.1% magnesium. 13 uh, to 14 billion years ago, when God created this whole thing, which was the Big Bang, which the Dogon called the Big Burst, then everything was tied to everything else. So you're the anything within everything. And the biggest part is you're a cosmic force. And when you draw on that force, I don't care what kind of problem you have, you got the answer. That was what Sandrea uh, was saying um, just a minute ago. Uh, so uh, the, uh, ancient, the ancients of the world understood that each person had God within them, and they understood that the stellar realm, the energies of that is inside of every human being, and inside of every human being is great power. And so my sister's point about victimhood, yes, we do face oppression. And yes, there is an element of that, but when you take on the mentality of that, then you've got a real problem because you have the solutions uh, to all of this. Um, now, let's talk about why astrology gets such a bad spooky rep reputation. Where did the put down on astrology start? And was astrology always separate from astronomy? Why the put down? What are some common myths about astrology? Hmm. Well, don't get me started. <laughs> um, because my sense, it was all very purposeful to separate astronomy from astrology and, to, and, then, and then to denigrate and put down astrology. Why? Because there's power when you know who you are. And when you don't know who you are, you're easily enslavable without even knowing that you're enslaved. Because they, uh, and, okay. So from what I, I'm, I'm bad with uh, remembering the Virgoian kinds of things, since I'm not that, but I think it, it was around 18... 1817, around in there, or 1718, I can't remember. It was around the time of the, um, when people were 
the, the heresy, you know, uh, all these different um, uh, people that had any kind of intuitive powers or whatever, uh, they were being taken, these big tri tribunals. I have the, the stupid notes, but God only knows where I put them. Um, but anyway, it started back in there during that time. Maybe you have some notes on that. I don't know. Do you? Yeah, basically, um, with um, Constantine taking on Christianity and stuff, and the Catholic Church uh, beginning, oh. you know, being the power center in Europe, um, there is a decision in the Catholic Church to separate astronomy from astrology. And that becomes something that becomes a part of the Christian legacy. But the Pope has the largest astrological library. And I want to say something right there there was a time i had taken my daughter to church and they did this sermon and they were connecting astrology with homosexuality and uh what blasphemy it was well after that sermon there was a dinner at that church and i sat across from that priest and i said well you know i happen to know that you have the largest library in the world of ancient astrology yeah I said, so why do you have that library? So he admitted to me that they actually study astrology. Priests study astrology. And I said, well, then if that's the case, why did you just give this sermon? Why are you putting astrology down? You know what he said to me? Because we're afraid that if we, uh, you know, lifted astrology up, people would go to the stars rather than God. But what he really meant, people would go to the stars rather than the than the church, rather than the priest, okay? So um, that was to me, that, that, that was blasphemy, that to know that, to know that astrology holds so many keys to our freedom and to our self-understanding and purposely keep that away from the uh, public. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's a part of uh, despiritualization because everything in the Western world has had spirit taken out of it. And um, so that astrology or yeah. intuition or higher spiritual powers, they're all put in the realm of insanity, crazy, mumbo jumbo. And in the case of psychiatry, Freud, who was the leading psychiatrist, uh, took the position that um, intuition should be removed uh, from psychiatry, um, that it's purely a rational system. Mm -hmm. And so Carl Jung, who had been a student of his, fell out with him on that. And uh, he's a, a European uh, who was into astrology, who was into synchronicity, saying that things in the universe have timing, they work together. And so he was into spirituality, and that's where they parted company. But Western psychology and psychiatry tends to follow Freud, as uh, the Catholic Church did with astronomy, astrology, he did with spirits. And so the separation of astronomy from astrology puts you in a position where you know the mathematical things you need to know about planets, and you're sending probes, spacecraft to different planets, starting with the moon. So you're studying the composition of the uh, earth uh, on these planets, but you don't, under, but you know their energy, but you're not interested in the energy. And, and what does the energy mean, except for power and control? So yeah, I think that uh, that's important. So by, it's not putting down astronomy, it's to understand that these two are linked. Yes. And one, gives you the application of uh, planetary movements, cycles, and a whole bunch of things. And the other, how does it apply to human beings? How does it apply to the earth? And so, but that's just one realm, astronomy, astrology. So uh, if you want to put something down, you say it's like astrology, you know, <laughs> meaning it's like crazy. <laughs> so always check stuff out. And a lot of stuff that they say isn't good for you is good for you. 
just check it out. I'm not saying going on the fact that they say it's not. It's, it is. I'm saying check it out and then make your own conclusion. Um, now, let's talk about your approach to astrology. Um, what are some of the divine powers that astrology helps us to appreciate as essential parts of our being? Well, the truth is, it's, it, the way I see it, all, every planet has its divine aspect. But it also has its shadow sign. And, uh, and for me, when I'm doing an, uh, uh, a chart, of course, I want to, I'm looking at all the planets, but when I want to uh, assess someone's spirituality, I want to know, I want to see where their Neptune is. Because in our solar system, Neptune is the highest, exudes the highest potential, the highest aspect of love. You know, it goes beyond this conditional love. It has this, um, this, this love, whether you're good, bad, or ugly. <laughs> um, and knowing that Neptune is one of the hardest planets for the average person to assimilate inside. Most people, they, they, they stop at the fear side and they don't go any, any deeper because sometimes you, you've got to go through, uh, I've experienced even terror. If you, if you don't experience what, what emotion is coming up and you try and put it under the rug, now that emotion is underneath you and it's going to start ruling you. So, um, and then especially now, Neptune is transiting in its own sign it's not going to do that again for another 165 years. We're in the midst of a spiritual renaissance. That's how I see it. And I believe that all this stuff, this virus, all these things that have been coming up, from my perspective, it's to get people so distracted on other things and being afraid and afraid for their life that they don't open up. They don't put themselves into the space where they can receive the grace and the, the, the spiritual um, potential for people to shift and grow and like lightning bolts has never been stronger since we've been alive on this planet. And there's gonna be generation for generation for generation that's not gonna have this opportunity. And so, as I said earlier, you know, um, Sacred Tarot can show us how to uh, enter in and derive the best that astrology, um, th the best out of each planet. And so key 12 in the Tarot deck, which is the hangman, he's hanging from one foot purposefully and, and he's emptying his head of everything. And as he empties, his head is full of light. The average person now is so enamored by their own biases and their own points of view and, and their own beliefs about things and beliefs and biases and opinions. That's all they are. Beliefs, biases, opinions. If we want to go to a deeper level to experience truth, we have to empty first. And that's what I've been saying in a lot of my time. Each time, every day, First thing I aim to do when I wake up in the morning is to let everything go. When you let everything go and, and, and you stay with this open mind, now you have the opportunity to hear something you've never heard before, to see something from a different perspective, a different plane. How we perceive things makes a big difference on how things show up in our lives. So um, I don't know, did, did, is this what, it, is this the answer to the question that you're asking? Well, it's your answer. It yeah, it's huh? a good answer. It's a good answer. Yeah, know? I mean, really and truly, this is such a mystical uh, time um, for people. And I know of the, of the friends that I have that are really making, making time to do their deep, meditation, that deep letting go, they are growing by leaps and bounds. 
And they, and then I have some friends that, you know, they, they have, they're, they're just at that fear side of the, of the Neptune and, and, and they're into contraction. They're into, um, oh my gosh, <laughs> just, I don't even want to hang with them. Let, let's just put it like, like that their energy, um, is it's it's sad. It's sad to see that that people are stuck in their fears. And the, and the only way for me, the only way to deal with fear is to go through it, to sit there and allow the self to feel it. And as you feel it, then the fear starts to um, at a certain point, and I know this for myself, what happened to me, I was living in Kentucky. And all my friends were basically in San Francisco. And I, I wake up at four o'clock in the morning. I can't call a soul. And I'm in terror. What the heck do I do, God? And, I, and I, I was told to open to it and let it be. And I felt like I was going to be stuck in terror for the rest of my life. And then all of a sudden, there was a pop. And I was experiencing the greatest love. I mean, I was in love. It didn't matter. Ku, Ku Klux Klan. There was nobody that was exempt from the love that I felt and that it was just pouring out over the world. It was my terror that was blocking it. And it couldn't come all the way out until I allowed myself to fully experience the terror. And um, many people don't want to go there. It's more comfortable to keep pointing fingers and either at the self or other people. Hmm. You know, what I'd also say is um, the astrological chart is the compact you made in heaven. You made this. And we've discussed this before in previous shows, the Ka or the Ori, your destiny. And we point out Destiny doesn't mean predetermined. You make choices. And so on earth, it's free will. Planets don't determine what you do. It's your free will. Of course, if you decide to exercise your free will outside of your gifts, outside of what you really enjoy doing, then that's an exercise of free will that can be cause, cause misery. But it's still free will. Free will governs here. And so that uh, astrological chart is the alignment of planets at the time of your birth. And in heaven, it's outside of time. Um, it's a realm of experience. It's infinite force that is God who's outside of time. And it's a realm outside of time. And so the planets, the alignment of planets at certain times, those are appropriate times for spirits who are leaving heaven to uh, deal with certain issues. And we know that from uh, parapsychology, gifted spiritual mediums, one of which is talking to you now, my sister, these spirits in heaven line up. It's not just individuals come from heaven. They come in groups mm -hmm. and they come with missions. And uh, your parents, you picked them before. You picked them for a reason. You may have been their parent in a previous life. A lot of you don't believe in past lives, but may that may be the case. But the key point is people are coming here in groups with, you know, purposes to, to take the earth, which is at one place to a higher level. So that chart is, is what you picked as your destiny fingerprint, if you want to call it that. You know what I mean? And it's a question of what you do with it. And, and I think the key thing is, if you pipe into your gifts for the purpose of helping others, that's when those vibratory forces begin to work. But if you're just wrapped up in yourself mm -hmm. and uh, going the corporate way and just doing things because you have to do it. And I know a lot of people have to do jobs that are miserable. So I'm not saying don't. If that's the way you have to earn a living, fine. Destiny ain't got so much to do with your job. It's got to do with your mission in life. And that could be your paid job or not. And when it is, then that's pure pleasure. 
you know. But when it isn't, then the most important time you spend outside of that miserable job is attending to those things that are inside of you. So that uh, ka, that's your basic birth chart. That's your chart. And when you look at it, you, in, in time, you realize that uh, you had a role in this. And I also think families come together for a reason. My sister and I, you know what I mean? My moon's in Pisces, there's a reason for that. My brother was 180 degrees different from me. That, doesn't, that didn't mean we were at war with each other. He had gifts I didn't have, I had gifts he didn't have. And I found his amazing. There was no jealousy. There was no, I wish I could do that. I'm satisfied with being me. But I found it wonderful to see him with his mathematical gifts and all the other things, his family gifts, because he was basically a family man. And so I know that, you know, we pick parents, we pick siblings for a reason. And it's not an accident. And if you got problems in your family, you'll say, oh, I wouldn't have picked them. The, the lady I met, we were in uh, Birmingham in Britain, and this is just before I met Pam, and we had a spiritual meeting the night before, and we were talking about picking your destiny in heaven. This young lady remembered when she was in heaven and the destiny she picked. And so did her sister. And then she made this comment but she picked the wrong mother. <laughs> I said, no, you didn't. I said, you picked a mother with problems. That's why you're saying she's wrong. But those are problems that you pick because those are problems you need to address too. You know what I mean? I said, don't be saying because your mother wasn't perfect. You, know, you picked the wrong mother. Which one would be right? <laughs> so that's one thing. You know, I'd, I'd say that, that the gift is you. And it's that uh, universe inside of you. And knowing that universe inside of you, uh, that's one of the most rewarding experiences and it's a lifelong experience. Anything else you want to add to that? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Nothing's okay, happening. now, this is, this is one we're going to conclude on and this is a very important one. I remember when we first started this show, close to the start, a young lady sent me a message and she said she felt broken. She felt that um, she felt that she was broken inside. And um, I can understand that. There's, this is a system designed to make you feel like that. And in fact, it's a, it, it's a system designed to break you. It wasn't just slavery where they did that. Yep. The system is set up to break you into parts, to put you under control. And I don't care whether you're high up, a lot of degrees and good job, I don't, whether you're locked in a prison, wherever, you know, the system wants to have its last say-so and it wants you to really serve it. And so a lot of people feel broken. Um, a lot of people feel there's something wrong with them. And of course, on the black side, we know identity wise, it's got to do with color and colorism and all of that. But then internally, it's got to deal with uh, whatever fault, shortcomings, weaknesses, trials, tribulations we've gone through in life um, lead, can lead us to believe that there's something wrong with us. Um, so how can astrology uh, help to correct this along with other things? Uh, and what has been your experience on how astrology has helped people heal and overcome serious life crisis like suicidal feelings? We have a lot of people now going to suicide and among blacks, some real young ones, the first time in our history. Mm -hmm. um, so how can it help us have a sense of worthiness and a sense of power. Wow. It's, a, it's amazing. I mean, even when I would work these psychic fairs where I'm, I'm giving 15 minute readings, there were, there were two women that uh, I'll never forget that came to me. One of them 
that came to me when I, I mean, when I looked at her, it looked like she was uh, like the walking dead. She was that depressed. And for me, I used God along with astrology. When I saw this, this woman looking like that, how can I help her in 15 minutes? And what I found in that case, I went into deep silence and I just kept looking, 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 and until I could feel like I connected with her soul. And when I did, she shifted. And then after that, I gave her the reading. I was able to mirror to her so she would know that I really got where she was coming from. I was able, you know, astrology showed me what to mirror back. And then I was able to mirror to her that there was another way. It was a way that she could rise up and look at her situation from another point of view, from a higher point of view, to shift. And I watched this woman's light come on in her, her eyes within this 15-minute reading. And then about three or four months later, I'm reading at another fair, and this woman comes in with this beautiful little, um, it was looked like a rosary, but it was a something that you would put around your wrist. And what she- We're gonna close and go to chat in a minute. (laughs) What she had to say was that that day changed her life. And she had never been depressed. Well, it was only three months later, but she hadn't been depressed again. And that she paid money to come into that fair so that she could give me this gift. Because she said that when I saw her soul, that was her first time that she started connecting with it. Other than up until then, she was just in victim mode. And then there was another woman that came. I was in this other fair and I had a lineup of people coming one after another. And this one woman sat down with a chair on the outside of my booth and waited for, I mean, it was like three hours. This woman waited. And when she came in to the booth and I, I just, you know, I didn't have to even look at her chart, looking at her, you could see this woman was in big trouble. And again, when I'm in a space like that, I don't know what it is that I had to say to her, but whatever it is that came through my assessment and in the way that I said it, again, the lights came on. And then she shared that at home, she had, placed all these things that she was going to use. She had these pills and blah, 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 that she was, if she didn't find help, she was going to take her life and it changed her. So astrology, what it does, truth sets you free. When you can mirror back to a person truths about themselves, then they can start to get a little bit of faith that, oh, astrology may really have something to tell me. And when they have that little opening, just that opening, that, that willingness to look at their selves from another perspective, from another point of view, and see themselves as that we are both human and divine. Once they can see that I can uh, connect with their, um, with, the, with their crises, that kind of side of themselves, then they have a, a greater trust in me that the, um, the antidote or the soul solution for what, you know, whatever I recommend that they need to embody more of it or embrace more of, they are more likely to utilize that. And I get a lot of incredible, I mean, the testimonials, the things people have said about the readings has always kept me encouraged and, um, and so grateful, so humbled, so grateful that this ended up being the thing that I got to do for my lifetime here. I don't know, did that answer your question or was there any yeah. other? Uh-huh. Uh, what are some of the things that you think uh, would drive people to consider suicide that astrology could help them overcome. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. And I mean, many things. I mean, you know, I think all, I don't know about, about you, but I've been, I've been pushed to the edge. There's been times in my life where I got really close. I mean, like when Harry was killed 
And I knew the instant that he died, that was the love of my life. I mean, I was in rage. I was in, uh, I mean, I literally sat there one night with the razor in one hand, contemplating just shh, and going. I think any, a lot of things can, can drive us to it. Um, astrology and um, a, a, other, a, a, a tarot reader, because tarot, if, if anyone really knows their tarot, each card in that deck is aligned with astrology. It's aligned with either uh, a sign or a planet, et cetera, et cetera. And um, that reading helped me because I knew, and that's when, because Adeline, our teacher, Addie, our teacher of astrology was very much against tarot. She fell for the bull crap that uh, tarot was of the devil. But when I, ha when I was sent to that reading and um, I didn't have to believe the reader. I didn't, I, in fact, I don't even re remember the reader. I remember seeing that there was the death card and there was the 10 of swords. This is a guy laying on his stomach with 10 swords in his back with blood coming out. I knew that there was a system that got me. And then there were solutions. I don't remember what they were now, but there were solutions in that. In that, in that spread and in that reading that helped me. And, and, and because of my love for Harry, you know, that I had uh, seen that my upset was upsetting him on the other, other realm. And so whatever I gained from that reading, that's what turned me around. That's what got me out of contemplating suicide. That's what got me out of, um, you know, um, feeling so depressed and sad, that sadness. So I think many, many things can come. And any, if a, if a person is a really good astrologer, the, pro, the, the, the solution is always with the problem. There's a gift in everything. And um, any really good astrologer will, will be able to help someone. I also was able to help a friend of mine um, who was really, uh, she was, was labeled uh, a depressive and she was hooked on all this medication. And so she came to me, she was a friend and a client and asked me, could I help her uh, get off her, medi her medication? And I worked with her for six months and we worked with, the, with her astrology and with her being able to really face the things that were coming up in her life and she was off that medication within six months. You know, she'd been down, down, down. And we stayed friends up until 2020 anyway. And uh, we had difference of, of views around that. And hope, hopefully she's still in there. She's in, in my heart. Hopefully I'm still in hers. But um, she stayed off. And that had happened back in 2003. And never again having to go to medication and never again going to those depths of depression and being able to uh, deal with her life as things came up. Um, when we were preparing for the show, you made some comments about um, how astrology is good for everyone, but you made some comments particularly about uh, astrology and other kinds of spiritual healing, particularly good for women. You know. Oh, it was so sad when I was doing that fair circuit. Some of the most beautiful women could come and show up, and you would see in their hands that they didn't believe in themselves. You could see um, that uh, underneath this um, beautiful persona was a woman that did not feel like she could was free to express herself. And, um, and then uh, it was called to my attention that really we uh, women living now, we are the ones that are the forerunners of freedom, that uh, women have been oppressed on this planet for a very, very, you know, for centuries. And that it's in our DNA. It's in our grandparents. It came, you know, great grandparents, grandparents came down through our mothers. And um, that women particularly um, needed to learn, need to learn to love themselves. And then, then you put it on top of women, that women are brought up to put everybody in front of themselves. 
And I am not a proponent of that because I, I look at things astrologically and the first sign is Aries. It's I am. And I need to discover it and start questioning and find out who I am. And then once I start finding out who I am, my job is to be the one to love myself. Everybody wants to get their love from their lover, get their love from somebody outside. I want my mother to love me. I want my brothers to love me. When inside of ourselves, we are craving for our own love. And until we can just be willing, and, and I would tell everyone that I'm working with, it's the first thing they're saying, I don't know how. I don't know how, God, but show me how to love me the way you love me. That's what started me uh, really shifting. And the clients of mine that I have shared that with, they, some of them have turned in a session, in one session to drop their baggage, all the crap they have on themselves because they got, they, got, they got such a big aha. Wow, love myself the way God loves me? Hmm. And just, I don't know how, but I'm going to love me. I'm going to love me as I am. Uh, I know I went through a phase in myself where I wasn't going to love myself until I got more perfect. I had an image I was going to, you know, line up with. No, I, I, I am here to learn to love my shadow, to love the big, bad, you know, witch or whatever with the bee there. You know, every single side of myself deserves to be loved. That's how God loves us. And that's our job. And I feel like astrology, some people want to put down the, like the sun sign astrology, but if we are willing to emulate that sun, then we come undone from all the binds that other people have put on us and that we have put on ourselves. Because what does that sun do? It shines its light on everything, everyone, all the time, everywhere. Whether it's a rabbi, a rapist, or a rabbit, that sun gives its life-giving love and light and energy, vitality. And that, I believe, is our job, that we are each the holy sons of God. And I like the spelling of S-U-N. We are the holy sons of God. And we don't get to really experience that unless we're willing to live it. And we don't get to live it unless we're willing to live, you know, to um, deal with our shadows, deal with our, uh, what is called imperfections. We yeah. are gods in our universe, yeah, but we don't get to find it out till we love ourselves. Yeah, and you know, your point about, um, confusing external love with love, um, wanting the affirmation to take the place of what has to happen inside of you. Someone saying they love you yeah, and you feeling unworthy. Um, that it's got to do with how you feel about yourself. And I would say there are dimensions. Astrology and other spirit systems are systems for the dimension of the spirit self the real self, the gifts, the positives and the negatives, the whole side. Love is unconditional. So you're supposed to embrace the whole thing. Um, and, and it's that. But then there's the ethnic part, which has happened through enslavement and different colonization and stuff. People have had their ethnicity, their color put down. And so these two have to line up. On the one hand, you have to love yourself, whatever your color, race, whatever it is, and love yourself in your spirit wholeness. Love yourself. And love is, is the ultimate thing. Self-love is a basis for all love. And, and we're taught that self-love is selfish. Huh, mm. Really? Mm. <laughs> Not hardly. It's the mm. precondition for everything else. And so uh, the work you do on yourself is key for the work you can do for others. And if you can't cultivate inner, inner love, how are you going to be able to bring it to someone else? In yeah. love relationships, 
we're looking for someone, as Sandrea said, to love us. The key thing is what we want is a relationship in which both people love themselves. And of course, there's an attraction. There's all the things that bring you into a relationship. And so that will be the rewarding thing. But if one of these is insecure on the issue of love, that's a problematic relationship mm. because it's external. That's her point. And um, because of patriarchy, the way this system is set up, where the man is supposed to be in charge and running everything, then women are really demeaned and devalued. And then women of color are even more demeaned and black women and Native American women are demeaned the most, you know? But they're the ones with great power. Women in generally carry the culture. Women are the ones that nurture and bring life forth. They say in prayer, God um, gives special care to mothers because they're doing what God does. They're nurturing. They're bringing life forth. They're developing life. So the feminine is extremely important. Not weak, it's strong. Water is a metaphor for the feminine. It overcomes everything. Yet it's nourishing and generally has no enemies. Of course, when you have floods, that's an excess of water. But other than that, everything needs water. And that's symbolic of the nurturing qualities of the feminine and of the mother. And so women have this great strength. And inside of us, males have that strength. And that was part of what I had to deal with when I went on my work, you know, to deal with this inner feminine side, you know, and to see the power of it, to nurture it. It shifted me. So my sister's magical work that got me on this retreat <laughs> took me to some places that I didn't know I'd go to. I mean, I would have not had the visitation of the light, but for that, you know, but for that, the communion with God. Um, and so, whereas I used to say the reality of the situation is, um, I'm all, almost always saying the spirit said, and um, when it's, those special visitations, um, God told me this. Now, now, when you hear me say this, I've only had these visits a couple of times. I'm telling you what I'm sharing with you, God's side of it, it's got no holes. I may have some, but not <laughs> God. And you'll find this is helpful. At least check it out. So this... Um, this, this feeling that life is so bad, you want to cancel it. One of the things that spirit healers know is this. The worst thing about suicide is this. It, it, it's, it's often condemned as a crime because you took your life. We certainly know if you take someone else's, that's a crime. So that's a reason suicide's a bad thing. Spiritually, the problem with suicide is this. You've exited here because of various reasons of which I'm sympathetic to. I understand people get drowned into this funk and this is it. But what's happening is you're avoiding lessons. Sometimes it's people who are facing painful death. And I'm not criticizing people who go in and do things to take their life. I'm not, I'm, I'm not doing judgment. I understand. I'm not in their position. I don't know what I'd do if I'm in their position. I'm just simply saying that, yeah, you, you forestall what you consider some pain, but you forestalled lessons. And sometimes those lessons are painful, sometimes they're joyful. And so that may well mean you postpone lessons. That may mean at another time, you're gonna have to repeat some stuff. <laughs> we're talking spirit here you know so um and, and then you don't know what you're gonna miss yeah it's bad right now it's real bad but um good and bad you know they're twin you know what i mean and and so what's bad today can be transformed tomorrow so you know it's it, it's understandable that people can go to that level 
But as Andrea's saying, in the end, it's how you see yourself. If you love yourself, um, I don't care how much pain you endure. As, as the old saying goes, I don't care how bad the situation is, God's made it so you can handle it. And even though you think you can't, guess what in the end you do? And you end up coming out stronger. So in a time in which a lot of people are talking about they need healing because they do, my sister is saying, the greatest healer is you. The greatest healer is you going inside yourself, knowing yourself, respecting yourself, and loving yourself. And I'm not against people going to psychiatrists and psychologists if you do that. That was my choice when I did on my 15 month thing. But I knew this, this was work I had to do. It's easy to go to a garden. I'm looking at my garden right now and spray it. I don't spray a garden because it's poisonous and I'm poisoning the food chain. I'm poisoning the birds. I'm poisoning everything and I'm poisoning myself. But it's easy because then you just go and kill all the weeds. It's the same thing when you're working on yourself. It's easy to get somebody else to do the work for you. The truth is, in the end, you've got to do it yourself. I don't care whether it's the psychologist or consultation with astrology. In the end, you got to do that internal work. And I call that gardening work, mm. self-cultivation work. Mm. When I'm out pulling weeds in the garden, I'm thinking about weaknesses that I'm pulling up. I'm an archer. Mm -hmm. So when I shoot at a target, I'm shooting at weaknesses. Bullseye doesn't mean <laughs> that I'm an excellent shot. It means, okay, I'm overcoming something so I can actually get to that target. Spirit is in everything. And if we approach life that way, then you know we see that uh, everything is an opportunity. Sandra was saying, uh, don't regard the hardest areas of your life as uh, final. No, those are the greatest opportunities. So we're not saying astrology is everything. We're saying it's one of the tools, but of all the tools, it's the master tool because it tells you what's up there that's inside of you. And please believe me, there's a cosmos inside of you. You're a cosmic force to be reckoned with as long as you're in alignment with truth. And even if you aren't, we get out of alignment. So we learn. Yeah. Yeah. So we learn. So you got yeah, anything yeah. you want to add in conclusion before we go to uh, the chat? Anything else oh, you want to? This was just, thank you, Chaka. I um I can't tell you how my heart feels that we're sitting here like this and just um, appreciate you so much, value you. I'm so glad you're my brother. And just thank you for including me in your work. And yeah. And I, I guess anything I would say to the listeners is that if you haven't checked out astrology, check it out. Mm -hmm. You might be very well surprised. Life is not the way, quote unquote, they say it works. It's really, what I found is life is far more mental than uh, people realize. That what we're thinking about, what we're focused on, makes a big difference as to what we're attracting into our life. So life can be really magical. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it is if we're focusing on magical things, and love is the most magical of it all. Got that right, and you know I love you. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I sure do. I feel it, and that that's con con congruency. I feel it out of your lips, but I feel it all the way down to your soul. And I hope you feel mine for you. And you know our parents are watching this. They're in heaven. Oh, yes. And uh, Aunt, Aunt Margie's here. Yeah. 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 H, my father, William Henry Bradley, Bill Bradley. Even, even Neil. He's, yeah, he's Neil. still kind of 
like he was kind of so and you know he's still kind of yeah well, i'm not so sure even there he's saying that but he's uh, here <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah my brother outsmarted himself on her <laughs> yeah <laughs> right he was so smart <laughs> he figured a lot of this stuff didn't exist so i'm yeah. sure when he's on the other side he's yeah. doing some real investigating scientifically yeah. <laughs> and he's still he's still in that in that stage kind of suspicious but yeah um, he's he's working at it <laughs> yeah 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 so uh this has been enjoyable and um we're going to do a part two next week and so uh st st stay tuned for that there was a question on here how can i get an astrological reading you want to give people your uh email address well, if you can spell my name, and my name is spelled S as in Sam, O N D as in David, R A Y A. And if you type in Sandrea at Sandrea.com, my ancient website will show up. <laughs> it's, it's a way to contact me. And it'll say, uh, Influence Your Stars. I was doing a column for a while uh, in a woman's magazine. And that was the name of the column. So I called my, um, but either either one, sandrea.com will take you to influencerstars.com. Right on. You got that? Say it again. So if people didn't write it down. Sandrea.com. S is in Sam. O, N is in Nancy. D, D as in David. R-A-Y-A. -A. Sandrea at sandrea.com. Or if it feels easier to use, influenceyourstars.com. It takes you to the same site. Okay. Um, okay, we've got some uh, comments here and uh, statements. Uh, Francine Leonard, uh, we can be experiencing battle fatigue from life. I had to learn not to do the work alone for personal transformation. We're not supposed. We're not supposed to deal with obstacles alone. Hmm. I think that's beautiful. I mean, I mean, I certainly have my tribe of healers that I that I work with, and um, yes, we're you know, if we if we were meant to live alone, why would we even come to planet Earth? We would just be each day in our own little universe. But I would also add, and I don't think Francine means this, that um, when you're going into the depth of a crisis, for example, those are things you have to address yourself. You yeah. get help, but uh, there, it's like weeding a garden, you know, some things you have to weed up yourself. So is that, there is that personal work that you have to do yourself. And that work is extremely rewarding at the same time as I think Francine meant, and as Andrea said, you have a network of people who give you support. And if, and if you're involved in service, that's also where the healing is because everything that you're learning, you as you grow, you're able to share that with others. And that's the whole thing mm -hmm. about spirituality. It's not in a vacuum, so. Yes, yeah. beautifully said, Chaka. Um, Janae Johnson, Janae, hey lady, uh, I dedicated my last show to you. I went to, we went to Janae's birthday party. I had mentioned this last week. She is a lovely lady, lady and I wanna have her on some of my shows. She does healing work, especially with young ladies. And she's been doing this for a long time. And she's walking, talking love. If you just see this lady, she exudes love. So I'm real glad that, uh, you joined us because I understand this is kind of early for you. Um, so I guess this topic drew you to the discussion. So I'm glad that uh, you uh, are on. Francine Leonard again, uh, facing your fears is a process. Yeah, what do you have to say about that, Sandra? Yeah, I would say it is a process. And, um, and that it is like in layers. 
And, and like anything else in life, I'm not so sure that it's ever really done with. At least it, I, it, it doesn't appear to be in my life. However, it's, um, it's energy. It is, it is usable. It, is, um, it fuels. It, uh, it can be fuel. So our whole relationship, I guess what I'm trying to say is our whole relationship, there's a time when our relationship to fear shifts. And it isn't like, you know, because the, the worst thing is to fear fear. If you do that, oh my goodness, that's not fun. And uh, that's kind of like what I had to go, go through with, with what I was sharing. But yes, we, um, we can get to a point where we have a whole different relationship with it. And then it becomes really usable. It's really great, um, great energy and power, courage. Um, Francine also said something here. What the F? <laughs> you never oh. blame. You never blame the victim. <laughs> uh, I could interpret this question to mean that if you're saying um, that you're a victim, and and we're saying, Sandra was saying, and I agree, uh, not to take on the position of victimization that woe is me, I'm being oppressed. It's not to say that we're not being victimized. That is, we've suffered from oppression and we still today. But the question is, I think what Sandrea meant, and she can clarify it, is that it's a question of how you handle these obstacles in life. Do you feel that they overwhelm you and there's nothing you can do about it? You just be woe is me, I'm being oppressed. Or do you take a stand against it? Here spiritually, it's a stand against the oppression of your spirit or the attempt to, because the spirit can never be broken. Spirit cannot really be oppressed. We can <laughs> as human beings, not the spirit. That's God within you. So what's your response to this, Sandra? Wow. Well, I got so involved listening to you. I had an idea that the idea just kind of like, evaporated as I'm listening to you. She's saying, you never blame the victim. What the F, you never blame the victim. What's your reaction to that? Well, ultimately in my philosophy, there's only victim if I choose it. And I'm gonna give an example. I, I don't know if I ever told you about this shocker, but I'm 21 years old. And I'm on this second date with this guy. And he's, he's saying he's not taking me home till he rapes me. Okay, and this guy has got a gun, all like that. But inside myself, I am not a victim. And inside myself, I'm screaming at God. God, I don't know how, but I am not going to be raped. Show me how. And, and, and I kept trying to talk and say things to try and bring some kind of a heart into his consciousness. And it finally hit me. I finally said to him, don't you want me to love you first? And whatever, when I did that, it shook him up and he changed. He goes, you go out with me again? I said, of course. And he drove me home. And I vomited at that point. That's when terror came up. But what it showed me at that young age that my intention, the power of my word, and that power of asking ye shall receive, the power of my word and my faith is what kept me from being victimized by him. And I've had other cases. I've had a case where Ku Klux Klaners were shooting at me, okay? And I am still not a victim. I stood there, God, what's going on? And uh, you know, the answer came and, and, and then I said, well, God, there's obviously some part of me that believes that there's more, that there's, that, that there's another power than you. Show me how to let that belief go. And I went and turned around and sat down and those people stopped shooting and they probably don't know why they couldn't continue to shoot. Because in my mind, I'm declaring my... Um, I am, a, I am a creator 
And, and our greatest tool, the tool of the magician in Tarot is our mind, is our word. I think in the African tradition, it's may do. There is, I think in the Dogon, they would say may do, it's your word, it's your staff, it's your wand, it's your intention. But if, if, uh, if I was coming from a victim point of view that I'm helpless, there's nothing I can do, I would have been violated that, that night or I would have been shot that day. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, really the things I talk about are the things that I, I live. You know, I, I believe that beliefs are not meant to be held on to as a belief. A belief is meant to be tested. You test it, you walk it, you live it, and then it will take you to the shores of knowledge, of knowingness. It's not meant to stay there. And that's what I have against most religions, that they are set up for you to believe in this. Well, if you just believe, notice, be, and uh, there's a lie, L-I-E, in there, if you just keep it there. Uh, Belief is a mutable sign. It comes under the sign of Pisces. Mutable signs are about exchange and working with, not about staying, not staying stuck in. Mm -hmm. So what we have is male power and female power here. So I'm gonna give you the male power side of this. (laughs) (laughs) Sandrea is saying a very important thing because um, she has a sense of power um, that you're not gonna put her in a position where you're gonna have control over her. She's gonna exert her authority in her way. She's a spirit woman. So she's (laughs) gonna draw on that spirit power. I've got all kinds of stories that I could tell you that she's told me (laughs) <laughs> about how she's faced a crisis and it was in a spirit way and it was powerful, you know what I mean? And so that is the key point about victimization. If you see yourself as the victim, you see yourself as powerless. Yeah, somebody is trying to oppress you, but if you take that on, it affects your whole being. It affects your whole being. And so the key thing is, if your mind is free, she, she made a point earlier that thoughts are powerful because thoughts are reality. Your thoughts become reality and people's lives are nothing but their thoughts and they don't know it very often. And so I've mentioned this before. I advise sisters a lot now since I went through my transformation. I was in no condition to advise them before. And it's because they asked for it. It's not because I'm going out and trying to give it. And um, <laughs> so relationships. And I always get this but situation. <laughs> I want a good man, but and I have to keep telling them that um, you're getting the but. <laughs> you're getting the but, not the relationship, because the but <laughs> assumes you're not going to get it. And until you get the butt out of your mind, and I don't mean the B-U-T that you sit on, but the butt, I would get it, but, you know what I mean? You're going to continue to get what you got. You know what I mean? So you're living your reality, or sisters say, no good black men out there. They're all gone. They're this, they're that. And very often they're saying it in the presence of good black men. They may not be good for them because good is what's good for you, but they're good. Check them out. Maybe you might find one there, but you're living your thought. And so in this case, your reality is you don't have one because you think there are none there. No, it's because that's what you think. So that's her point there. Real important, how you think. So when you love yourself, then your thoughts are positive. They're loving. And you're going to attract that. Janae Johnson, who's on this thing here, She's an embodiment of this. Fanya, who's also on this good friend of mine. She's an embodiment of this because they love themselves. They draw that. You know what I mean? They draw that. So it's got a lot to do with your sense of love. Now, going to Sandrea's Ku Klux Klan situation, I have an actual story. I'm not going to tell you. It would scare you. (laughs) I'm not going to tell you this. But I'm going to tell you, I dealt with the Klan, baby. (laughs) The Klan didn't want to deal with me. But here's the key point. 
when you have a sense of love of self, knowledge of self, and respect of self, you regard the world as a place where you're here to make your contribution. You regard the world as um, a place where, where things are wrong, you're here to change it. And you make your change. And you do it in groups and you do it personally. And so a lot of us are so caught up into this victim thing and this negative thing and all the things that are happening wrong to us that we have then no time to create. And that is the real key thing about life. Mm -hmm. We are here to create in our way. Each of us has our way. And whatever your way is, as long as it's good for humanity, pursue that way. And that's your happiness. And that's what real love produces. So um, I think what Sandrea said is, is really powerful. And what she did to this guy that was gonna rape her. I know that was the last time you ever saw him. Oh, of course. <laughs> but he was he was threatening me for quite a while. But I didn't want to tell anyone in the family because he had a gun. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I didn't, you know, if I had told, you know, you or Neil or dad, I didn't want him to be able to kill him <laughs> or be in any. Yeah, kind of, exactly. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, um, yeah, that was that was a really intense thing. But it, 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 it showed me that I could walk through my life fearlessly that I could, you know, that I really can ask for what I need and that I will receive. Uh -huh. That uh -huh. was major. Uh -huh. um, we have a sister here, Pamela George. I'm wondering if this is the Pamela George I know. Thank you for your continued work. Your sister is amazing and helpful uh, to me. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, Cinnabar, my computer man, was asking me to answer a question someone asked. Who's the artist uh, that did the work? Can you see his name on the picture? Just to say, I think it's, uh, isn't this a beautiful picture? You know what? I've looked on it. He did not, oh, here it is. A-H-M-E-D-A-L-I. Ahmed Ali? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think this is just incredible. I think um, I told um, you, I, I, had, I was asked to do Black history at one of the schools around here. And it's a school where there's like, you know that some of these kids' parents are like Ku Klux Klanner types. Anyway, I brought that as a background. And I think I told you, Shaka, at the end, here's this, 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 this kid and he looked like a little Hitlerite. He walked up and he pointed to the, uh, the chalice. And he wanted to know, what was that? What did that mean? And God knows what God told me to tell this kid. It just came through. And when I was done, the kid goes, stuck his hand out. And he goes, I like you. And I knew that there was a break there, that he wasn't going to continue on in the way of his father. And so it happened through this painting, which was, of course, the gift from you. Thank you, Shock. I love it. Yeah, uh, that artist uh, is no longer alive. Oh. Uh, he did a lot of art for the community. His price was very reasonable. And um, I have a lot of his art in my kitchen right now. It used to be in the living room, in the family room, it's in the kitchen. Uh, very gifted brother. He lived in Sacramento at the time. Mm. I'd ask, is this Pamela George? Hey, Pamela. <laughs> <laughs> Pamela George is a very important sister who is a part of a team with Dr. Wade Nobles and Lawford Goddard um, and mm. a few others. And they did a lot of groundbreaking research on the Black family. And of course, Dr. Wade Nobles is a leading African-centered scholar uh, with a specialty in the family. And I'm going to have him on this show and uh, like to have you on, Pamela, too. And she had a great father who was an assemblyman. I remember going to his memorial, a uh, good man. Um, yeah, oh, one person says they have two of Ali's paintings. Yeah, he was a community uh -huh. artist, you know. Um, let's see some of these other things from Pamela. Thank you for your continued work. Your sister is amazing and helpful. Uh, ah, 11, peace, love, happiness, and safety be upon us. 
y'all. Janae Johnson, thank you. Um, a student from my favorite SFU professor speaking with his sister. <laughs> this is beautiful, profound <laughs> conversation. Thank you. My students are where I've grown. You know, I've learned yeah. a lot. One of my books came from a student asking a question that I didn't have an answer to. So <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how you think you're not going to grow. Um, and then Keisha Maddox, great discussion. How do we get in touch with your sister for a reading? We just gave you that and she'll give it to you again. And you'll put that in your, yeah. in your chat box. Okay. Yeah, Is there someone on your team that does that in your chat box? Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Yeah. Definitely. It'll be on the chat box, folks. Um, let's see. Okay, this is from um, Nai Ashar Haroon. Love this dialogue and information on the connection with comedic cosmology and astrology. Because of my comprehension of comedic cosmology, I see it clearly through astrology, Tarot, and others. You want to make some comment on that? No, I don't. I, I think she said it. I, I don't. I don't hear a question. So. Yeah. Okay. I think really to answer. That's great. Uh, the same person getting my incarnation reading through the comedic oracle of Tehuti deck did the same for me, knowing how Asar Heru functions in my life. So these are comments off of the Tarot card and uh, this brother is making the comment that he got this through uh, comedic uh, readings. Um, my, uh, my friend, Fanya McKinney, Sandrea, good to see you. It's been a long time. Hi, Fanya. I remember you. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. <laughs> uh, uh -huh. Um, loud to zoo, love your work, glad the channel is active. Um, see if there's any other comments here. Now, I think that's it. These others are uh, comments of thank you. So, anything you want to say in uh, closing, Sandra? Hmm. Just looking and seeing if anything wants to show up in my mind. Hmm. It feels, it feels really complete right now. Just again, thank you for allowing me to be here on your show and looking forward to coming back next week. And Same here. And, and give people your uh, email address one more time and then we'll post it also. The spelling of my name, uh, S is in Sam, O, N, Nancy, D, David, R, A, Y, A. And then you just spell it out, sandrea at sandrea.com, which will take you to a very ancient, outdated website, but it's a way to connect with me. Just know I'm just coming out of this uh, retreat mode. Um, it goes to influenceyourstars.com. Okay. 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 Well, thank you, Sandra. This has been beautiful. Oh, it's been wonderful. It was really fun. enjoyable. Yeah. Same. Too. Yeah. Okay. So we look forward to people next week. We'll see you then. And uh, we're going out. All right. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Bye.